commander panel here at SCG Con. I am you all Jeremy excited? Noll. I am Jeremy Noll, your moderator. Uh, to my left, we have Gavin Verhey. Hello. If you'd like I to introduce yourself very quickly. I am a senior game designer at Wizards of the Coast. I design a lot of things, but most notably for the Commander audience, I was a lead designer on Battle Bond, Woo! Commander 2017, and Commander 2018, which isn't quite out yet, but is pretty awesome. Uh, next to him is Sheldon Mennery. Hi, everybody. My name's Sheldon. Uh, I'm a trophy husband in my regular life, and uh, I'm the... Can we, can we say creator? Pioneer? Pioneer. Pioneer of Commander. And next to him is Benny Smith. Hi there, I'm Benny Smith. I've been writing about magic uh, for Star City 19 years or so now, and... Uh, <laughs> 19, aren't you adorable? Nice. <laughs> I'm sitting with my 12 over here and I feel so inadequate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wrote the, thanks to uh, Sheldon bringing the uh, format to the masses, I was inspired to write a book about it called The Complete Commander. And I uh, write about Commander every week on Star City, and I love the format, and uh, thank you guys for coming out. <laughs> All right, so first up, I want to ask uh, Sheldon, there's been a little bit of stuff written about this on the actual Commander website where everything lives, a little bit of the history behind it. Can you tell us how the Commander format kind of developed in the first place? Well, it was, it was a product of one of the, my friends, when I lived in Alaska, we had a, we had a small gaming group that used to meet at uh, the apartment of one of our friends every Monday night. It was a, you know, we, we would just do lots of board games, RPG, we had a regular RPG group, PlayStation games, whatever, uh, and we were all also big Magic players. Um, uh, at one time, I used to be a Magic judge and uh, run some events, and we would always play Magic this, Magic that. And one night, one Monday night, like, uh, yeah, Adam came up with this kind of cool format called Elder Dragon Highlander. Uh, you know, what do you think? And was, there were five, five original players, everybody, and that was it. And I'm like, oh, kind of, yeah, that seems kind of cool. And then the second week, I went back and I started really thinking about the format because they, they told me about how they were playing it. And I was like, well... You know, to make it sustainable, it probably needs to do this, this, and this. There are cards that had to be... Like, Biorhythm was the first card that I knew had to be banned, because every game was race to a Biorhythm, end the game. Um, so I, I was in Alaska until uh, 2003, and I transferred to Langley Air Force Base, and I brought it with me. And some of, some of my readers that lived near Langley... Um, contacted me. It's like, oh, we have a gaming group. You know, you want to come hang out with us? That's cool. And we just played kind of multiplayer magic, and we... There were real casual players. I mean, really casual players. So, you know, there are folks that have collections of a couple of thousand cards instead of maniacs like Benny with a couple of hundred thousand. Um, so, it's like, well, there's this, there's this format that we had up in Alaska. You want to try it out. So to make this relatively long story very short <laughs> uh, they loved it soon it was all they wanted to do we'd come up they would come over to my house on Sundays I'd cook and like do you want to play no, we want to play Elder Dragon Highlander and in early 2004 I wrote an article about it for Star City and then took it to my friends on the Pro Tour and the judge community on the Pro Tour um, soaked it up like a very dry sponge in a very large pool and from there, it just exploded. I, the, the judge community was the, the, the primary evangel of the format. And, uh, yeah. And you and, all, uh, in the beginning, you all played with the actual Elder Dragons, right? Right, right. But once we expanded the group outside of five people, you know, the idea was you had, you had one. That was it. And nobody else could have that. Nobody else could put Nicole Bolas in their deck or whatever. And we... Uh, had to loosen that a little bit. And then, you know, and again, ban a bunch of cards. Now, is it true that that's why commander damage is 21? Because it was three hits from a 7-7 dragon? Yes. It's, it was three hits from the 7-7 dragon. And it used to be just 21 damage from the commander, not combat damage. And then cards like Heartless Hitsugu 
And Niv Mizzet came out, and we're like, uh, <laughs> this is awkward. <laughs> so we came up with a, uh, in about 2006, uh, Gavin Duggan, who is a, uh, who was a regional coordinator and former level four judge, and um, Duncan McGregor, a Canadian level three judge, who was a big fan of the format, got together with me. He's like, we need to formalize this. So that's when we started the website. That's when we really formalized the rules. And again, we had to, we had to quit with some things and think about how it would become a sustainable format. I mean, we it, from the beginning, we really wanted it to be the anti-tournament format. And I think we've been pretty successful. I think so, too. All right, so from there, it's been, as you said, about 2003 is when it really started to take mm -hmm. off. Uh, and it's, it's grown by leaps and bounds, obviously. So much so that uh, Benny here basically wrote the book on the format. So uh, what, what kind of inspired you to actually write a full book about Commander? OK, well, um, the format was exploding in popularity. And uh, there was tons of new people getting into the format. So I thought um, what would be kind of fun would be to have a book that could, like the goal of the book was to try to get like a person who was new to the format to like get up to speed as quickly as possible. And I reached out to a friend of mine, MJ Scott, um, as, a, as a, my manager for the project, and she helped kind of formulate sort of the design of the product. And uh, we got some people to uh, write some um, fan fiction to put in there um, so that even if you were like a commander veteran, like even if you knew most of what I was writing about already, um, Maybe you could get something out of it too. Uh, it just it kind of snowballed, and we got a lot of people to help out. Sheldon put in a good word, and there was a lot of uh, other uh, luminaries from the format that that kind of chimed in and helped uh, give it a little bit of credibility. And uh, it 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 did pretty well. I I, I was very happy to. Uh, uh, it did pretty well. <laughs> I I haven't seen a royalty check yet. Well, <laughs> it's getting close to the to royalty okay. levels. Okay. All right, and then also, as we know, not only did Commander inspire a full book to be written about it, but it was a format that was essentially just a bunch of people hanging out in their kitchen, playing while having dinner, and it's developed to the point where now it even has its own product yearly release on it. Uh, the first one was in 2011, and it just came out, and it was called Commander, and it was a set of five pre-constructed decks, and it was so popular that they realized they wanted to make it a yearly, a yearly release, didn't have time to get one out for 2012, but every year since then, from 2013 on, has had an additional one. Uh, Gavin, you've been working on the last two years' worth of them. Do you know what like the origins of trying to actually just make this pre-con were at all? Yeah, I absolutely do. Well, at Wizards, what we always try and do is take things that players love and let people do them. It makes a lot of sense. If you enjoy playing our game, we want to give you what you enjoy. And so when Commander was growing so huge and Sheldon was writing about it and we saw it just grow and grow and grow and grow, we thought, hey, people really seem to like this thing. We didn't really have an established casual format. People just kind of played whatever they had, right? And there was Commander at the time, but, but there was also Singleton and 100 Card Highlander and Prismatic five, and all this five stuff. Five Color and yeah. Five Color, right. And this was the first one that really took hold. We saw it was going just like gangbusters. And well, why not make a product out of it? So we made it a one-off product, something innovative and new, and everyone loved it so much. Probably doesn't hurt we put like Flusterstorm and Animar and cards like that in there. <laughs> but everyone loved it so much that we thought we would make it every single year. And so we have, you know, we had to stop gap in 2012 with um, uh, Commander's Arsenal. But after that, it's just come out like clockwork. And it's been a total blast. And it's a great relationship we have that we get to put out new cards for this format. And then the Commander Rules Committee also gets to, you know, they get to help manage the format, figure out the ban list, that kind of stuff. And it's a really great relationship between Wizards and the Commander team. Cool. Uh, speaking of the pre-cons, something that comes up pretty much every single year, and this is something that we'll, we'll go down the line and start with Benny and then come back to, to get the actual uh, designer perspective on it. Something that comes up almost every year is that it feels like at least one of the decks is substantially weaker in some way than the rest. Uh, do you feel that way? And do you think there's anything that could be done to help that? Um, 
There definitely seems to be a little bit of difference power-wise, but uh, I've always kind of taken it as a challenge. Uh, if something feels a little less powered up, I like to try to figure it out. You know, that makes you want to dig deep. And actually, if something feels too overpowered, uh, personally, I, I, I guess I got a, I root for the underdog. So I like to just kind of dig in with, with maybe the pap less taken and okay. uh, take my lumps from the, from the powered up deck. Oh, shit. <laughs> I, I, when you, I think you have to look at that from two different perspectives, whether you're playing them with each other mm -hmm. or playing them outside the close group. And uh, I can imagine situations where uh, one of the overpowered ones in the group is not necessarily overpowered outside. Uh, right. When we played a, the league with the, uh, the experience counters one, which one was that? 2015. Yeah, 2015. Um, we played a league with that, and we just had to gang up on the red-blue player to kill him. He, it's not that he was doing anything in the first five or six turns. It's just when he, when he got to X mana, game was over. So, yeah, he had to take him out. Um, I, I think I, I understand how difficult design and development is, and balance is really a thing. And uh, I kind of appreciate the fact that uh, there's, there's never going to be... 20%, 20%, 20%, 20% of five decks. They're, they're, they're going to be on either side. Yeah. Uh, but like Benny said, you just take that as a challenge, and that's how you, it's like, okay, this is the week when I'm going to take it and fix it up a little bit. Sure. Yep. Well, as we all know, Commander 2017 was perfect, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with it. No, um, you know, a great thing about, about multiplayer is it's very self-balancing. If you're playing a four-player game, if one of the decks ends up a little weaker, well, that's actually kind of okay because, like, the Mizzix situation, it self-balances a little bit. Everyone goes and attacks Mizzix. Maybe the other deck is, is, you know, stays fine. In Commander 2017, I'll use that as an example. I think, and I'm curious if you agree, Jeremy, a lot of people felt like Wizards was the underpowered one. Yeah, I feel like that's the one that people kind of saw and thought this could... There, there was issues with Wizards feeling a little underpowered and the Dragon decks mana base kind of feeling underpowered. But other than that... I think that was the basics. I would say that the Wizards deck is one of the hardest to pilot properly. Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of the power differential comes in. You pick up the, the cat deck, it's pretty straightforward. Play some cats, give them some toys, smash them face. You play the Wizard deck and you have like all these triggers and you've got your, uh, Emin, your commander off to the side who's letting you copy your Wizards when you cast them. And to play that deck properly, it takes a very yeah. high level of finesse and skill that maybe someone buying a pre uh, previous commander deck not, some people have it, but some people might not be as experienced with that kind of gameplay. So I, I think that the Wizard deck actually is quite popular, and in our internal playtest, it actually won a lot. But you know, when you have a very wide range of skill levels playing it, um, that might not always be the case. On the flip side, though, it is self-balancing, and I saw the Wizard deck win a lot in the real world, too, just because people say, oh, the Wizard deck, yeah, we'll leave them alone, no problem. And then 20 turns later, they've assembled their massive death machine combo, right. and it's bad news for you. So. Yeah, we, we had the unfortunate experience on Commander Versus when we played the pre-cons of Justin Parnell played the Wizards deck and didn't get any black mana for several turns. And that it, it happens in your games of Commander that sometimes you just do not get that one color of mana. And so I think that vastly just like changed the way the game would have gone because Justin is a fairly skilled pilot and probably would have figured out a lot of those lines. So, uh, so I do feel like that kind of was one of those oh, it proved the situation, but it was only just one game. So you the, can't take that as all of the proof. The Wizards deck feels to me like it doesn't have a great deal of comeback capability. That it can, you know, it, it's once it's behind, it's behind. Obviously, if you leave them alone, then they can, like you said, build the death machine. But uh, the cat deck, on the other hand, could just be got nothing except an equipment or two, and then boom, boom, boom. Lifelink and Death Touch, and we're done. For a green-white deck, the cat deck surprised me every single time. I think they'd be down and out, have no creatures in play, and before you know it, they play an end step flash creature, untap, give it a bunch of equipment, and go to town. It's really, really remarkable. You know, another thing about the design process for these decks, too, is every, every one of the decks is designed by a different designer on the team. So a commander team has four people. Each deck's designed by a different person. So you kind of get a bit, a bit of that person's personality in the decks. And you can see that when you play them, they all have, feel very different. Like the cat deck was designed by Mark Gottlieb. Gottlieb is a very crafty player. And for what seems like it could be a straightforward deck, he built a very kind of crafty take on it. So 
I think that in cases like that, yeah, the wizard deck it does fall through and it falls behind a little bit, but the person who built it really, really enjoyed the kind of combo potential it had, and so they kind of put it in that direction. And it goes to show, as a commander player, you could take these commanders and these cards and take the decks in totally different directions. There's a bunch of different ways you could build that wizard deck. Aggressive, controlling, combo, it's all there. Cool. All right, so speaking of, of themes and such like that, uh, one of the things that I think a lot of people are curious about is, let's let's ask each of you individually, starting with Benny, how do you go about developing a commander deck? Like, if there's a specific card or specific legendary creature that you think, I want to build a deck around this theme or around this, how do you go about starting off building your deck? Well, a lot of times it, it starts with the new set and the spoilers that are coming out, and I'm pouring over the spoilers looking for the new legends. And... Uh, I'm, I'm the kind of guy, uh, when people ask me what my favorite set is, I'm like, what's the new set coming out that's my favorite, right? So the, the new legends that, now that Wizards really has embraced the format, they just, you can just tell in the, in the legends that they make that like, this is, this is a little love letter to the commander players, right? So like, for instance, um, when Battlebond came out and I was all excited about so many different cards and then they previewed Grathama, right? That big green weird creature. And it just called out to me, right? It was like, hey, you, you, you got to do something with that. Um, so mostly it's, it's top down. So I take a, a, a commander that looks cool, that's new, and I want to brew around it, right? So the vast majority of the time, it's, it's top down based off of a new commander that's come out. But occasionally there'll be a card or some kind of card interaction that'll come up. And that'll be an interesting way because you kind of have to design backwards in a way, um, which, is, which is a challenge, but it's, it's fun. So... I would say, you know, most of the time it's it's top down based off of a brand new commander, okay. but so, the other ways kind of yeah. Like like Benny, I, I'm a fan of the new cards. I mean, we've had the old cards, so we we get the new card. I see the new cards. It's like, all right, what kind of cool decks can I build around this? And with these cool new cards, but I want to make sure that I honor the cards that have come from the past. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a Mirage card in my Pirates deck uh, because. There was a cool pirate back then, and it needed it needed to go in. Uh, so for the most part, again, like 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 Benny, top, pretty much top down. What do I want a deck to do? Or this just seems like a cool idea. Where I can, where can I take it? Uh, you know, sometimes sometimes a deck just suggests itself from the commander, right? Yep. Uh, and then other times, you you try to find an angle that is the the path not taken, and occasionally. A card will suggest itself. Um, I think one of my most popular decks, you, you did this to yourself, started with Paralectric Feedback. Um, one, of the, one of my friends, Todd Palmer, at the, at the game shop, is like, have you seen this card? And it's from Ravnica Block someplace. He's like, yeah, that seems like a, you know, because this was right around the time people were, were um, cabal coffering, exsanguinating. Like, this, this seems like a, a card that you could, and then of course I started looking at every card that did the same kind of thing. So the deck really doesn't do anything unless somebody else is trying to do something broken. Okay. Uh, then, yeah. then they do it to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gavin, do you have any sort of build around that you do? For your yeah. own? Yeah, normally my boss comes to me and says, we're going to need four <laughs> more commander decks for next year. There you go. What ideas do you got? Um, you know, a big one for me, and it, these guys kind of hammered it already, but it really is the legends. I see a new legendary creature yeah. and just promotes so many ideas and creativity. I think why commander is so popular and why it's persisted for so long and why it's the most popular multiplayer format is instead of just saying, go build anything, it gives you these hooks. You see Niv-Mizzet, and you're like, oh, what, what can I build with this? You see Grothalma, you're like, what in the world can I build with this? It gives you these hooks you can kind of dive into and latch onto. You know, we talk, uh, Rosewater talks a lot at work about how restrictions breed creativity, yep. and it really, really is true. If I tell you, build a blue-red deck, there's a million options you could think about, and you're not sure how you're gonna do it. I tell you build a Mizzix deck, you're like, okay, you can put a bunch of spells, and yada, yada, yada. So it really helps you build a bunch of decks, and importantly, makes you want to build a bunch of different decks. You don't just have your one blue-red deck, you've got your niv deck, you've got your Mizzix deck. You've, and those two decks might play in totally different ways, but they're equally fun and enjoyable. So I, that to me, the legends are really the key of what makes Commander work, and that's where I always start. Hey Gavin, I had a quick question. Yeah, yeah. So 
When you're designing these cars, and I'm assuming that you're seeing early versions of Legends, are you like thinking, hey man, I'm gonna build the commander deck about that, and then it changes, and like you got, you're like, oh, that deck no longer works. Is that is that part of the process, or do you hold back and wait before until the final version? Um. You know, doing your job well at Wizards is a funny reward because you build the deck and then your card gets nerfed and it's no longer playable. Um, it's happened many times. It's like, guys, you built a sweet combo deck. Check it out. You play two games. Oh, that's definitely broken. And like the four hours you put into building that combo deck is, just goes down, the, goes down the drain, except you guys don't have to all deal with it anymore. So, um, you know, it comes to legend design. Because we know Commander is so popular, really every single legend we make these days, we put through the Commander paces. We want to make sure that it is something that will be fun in Commander, that's enjoyable in Commander, and tries to have those Commander wrinkles. So, um, you know, occasionally we'll make ones outside that. We made Colagon, for example, that cares about playing the second copy of a card, which doesn't exist in Commander. And that was kind of needed for a constructed uh, standard. But for the most part, we actively think about it and try and find ways to make it work. Um, a great example to me is Ishkanaw Graph Widow. This is the mono green spider. Ended up being a legendary spider. Ended up being quite strong in standard. But me and a few others were like, Sam Stoddard, please please give this a black activated ability of some kind so you can build your green-black spider deck. <laughs> and eventually he relented and put it on there, and I'm so happy he did, because now you can build yep. your black-green spider deck. So it's tiny little twe tweaks we make there that really, really uh, can help improve the cards for the commander format. And that's what I love about putting those cards in the main sets, as well as the early commander releases, where we get to do all kinds of crazy, wild things. Kind, kind of going off of what Benny was asking, too, have you ever gotten to a point where you see a, a legendary creature in development in standard, and you're just like, hey, we're going to steal this idea for a commander precon before putting it in standard. So normally standard sets get priority. So if we're going to put okay. something in a standard set, it's, that's the thing that everyone gets, gets to touch. And if it's a card that is fun in commander and a card that's fun in standard, that's sweet. It's, you get to play it in standard and commander. But if there's something that gets... Uh, that, what happens more often, Jeremy, is something will get kicked out of a mainline set. And I'm like, hmm... I know a product that could use this. Let me steal this for myself. And so every now and then we'll take a card that gets kicked out and move it into a mainline, uh, mainline commander set, and it's great. I love yeah. them doing that. That's kind of what I was going. Yeah. yeah. There, there, right. There's one, well, there's, a one, there's one coming out that, that is an example of this. I'll, I'll tell you more in a few months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Almost got him. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So is that the one, uh, is that the one if that anybody has any questions at all, you can feel free to come up to our director area and they will make sure to get those up to us. But we have some questions that were submitted via email before time. Uh, and so there's there's a few questions here for uh, pretty much everybody. So the first one up comes from Jacob Sisson and we'll go with Benny first. Which unique theme from a past commander product do you hope returns? I.e. like Planeswalker, Commanders, Experience, Partner, something like that. Something that's been unique to them. Please tell me, I need more ideas. <laughs> Wow. From uh, from commander from previous commander yes, sets from, or any previous from previous commander sets, what what is one that uh, that from that you hope returns someday? Because we just had the uh, the partner mechanic return in Battle mm -hmm. Bond, so things like that. Well, I'm a long time D and D player, so the experience counters seem kind of cool. I, I understand that that's probably a pretty hard thing to balance out, right? But I thought the experience <laughs> counter uh, mechanic was really kind of cool, and and would love to see that maybe revisited. Maybe with some, I don't know, any potential ways to interact with it as a, as a check. I don't know, but I thought that was a pretty cool mechanic. So I, I'd really like to see the, the amount of mana you spent on the commander revisited. Because in, sometimes to bring you really cool cards, des designers and developers have to push the envelope. When you push the envelope, occasionally it breaks. And a couple of those... Are a little are a little broken. Prosh, <coughs> prosh, prosh. <laughs> hey, so the, what, what so a weird earlier, prosh cough I have. Earlier, earlier, sit down, and uh, you know some folks are playing, and a guy sits down, and he's got prosh, and I'm like, really? He's like, no, it's fine. And then he pulls out his food chain play mat. <laughs> now I have to give him a lot of props because he actually had cobalts. He had cobalts carry keep, and. Um, we killed them anyway. <laughs> but yeah, I, that, it seems like there's some space, and Command Zone Matters is another one that I think has a lot of room to be, to just do really cool things, and I think you could do it without going to the other side of the line. And obviously you can't tell us anything about 
future sets or anything like that, but w was there one that you preferred that you hope to someday bring back? Well, you know, what I'll say is what surprises me the most is how much design space there is still left. Okay. What excites me a lot about Commander is we've done a lot of really cool things, experience counters, planeswalkers as, as commanders, partner, but there's some things that you haven't even seen yet and we're that are in the far future of Commander that are really cool coming down the pipe. So for me, I'm already excited about some stuff returning you don't even know about <laughs> yet. <laughs> stuff that's and coming out in six months or a year. Or so just wait till 2029 and then you'll be able to see it all <laughs> in its glory. Awesome, awesome. All right, so this has been one of the things that I feel like has really been a lot more in the forefront since the announcement of Brawl, and that is Planeswalkers as Commanders. Uh, do we think that this is something that could happen or should happen sometime in the near future or even now? Like, what would, what would your reaction be, Benny? Um... I actually kind of like the fact that that uh, the planeswalkers are not necessarily legal as commanders unless they specifically say so. Because I do think that there's some commanders or some planeswalkers that would just be way too oppressive if you could just kind of play it whenever you want to. Uh, I know a lot of people would probably disagree with me on some of that, but um, and I think like it does open up some space where you can say this this thing has been designed to be. A commander, and that's pretty cool. So I'm I'm all, I'm all for keeping uh, planeswalkers from being official uh, commander like, characters, and I think it also gives brawl a little spice to kind of di differentiate it from uh, you know from from commander itself. Why don't you answer second? Well, I know Sheldon's got feelings about this. You know, <laughs> you know, one of the great things I think about not doing things is it lets you do them and make them exciting. And so, for example, in Battle Bond, we have Will and Rowan Kenrith, who are especially exciting because they can be your, your commanders, right? The special ability that they have. So, I mean, well, I also agree with Benny that it's nice that Brawl has its own little category. But ultimately, you know, what's important to me as a designer at Wizards is that the Commander Rules Committee gets to make the call here. They play the format the most, they're the closest to it, and in this cases like these, I mostly leave it up to Sheldon and say, hey, what do you think is going to be good for the format? Think about it. Let us know. And I know Sheldon's got some thoughts, so I'll let him share them now. Maybe if Planeswalkers had been designed um, with being commanders in mind, there would have been a chance. But uh, like Benny alluded to, there are just too many of them that are a little busted. And I think, I think if, somebody, if somebody forced me to make all Planeswalkers Commanders, there would be a bunch of other cards that I think would get banned really, really fast. And, you know, that, we don't want that. We, you know, we want, we, want the open ex we want the open experience. And it's also not like you don't have a bunch of choices for Commanders, right? There's thousands something legendary creatures uh, and a few Planeswalkers that can be your Commanders. Just mechanically, mechanically the Planeswalker being able to return to the... To the um, to the command zone, especially after you ultimate it off or get it, get the emblem or what, becomes technically problematic. And yeah, I we I mean we certainly on the rules committee have talked about this again and again and again because we always want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. It's not no never that you know full stop. So a year you know a year after we had the conversation the first time, it's like let's talk about this again. And we've had the conversation and we keep doing it and we keep. keep basically coming to the same conclusion that it would take away some of the identity of the format uh, just like you can't have um, a legendary land as your commander although you know what if you wanted go ahead <laughs> no one all my commander is Karn's Temporal Sundering can I get a legendary <laughs> sorcery commander how, how does that sound to everybody Mike. so yeah I, one, of the, one of the things we do on the rules committee is we really want to keep the band list as tight as possible. Uh, it's obviously, as magic grows, it would be unreasonable to think that it would get smaller. So we have to sort of emotionally prepare for it to get larger. But that means that, well, there's a lot of cool cards. And these guys, I will say, these guys have been great at making compelling, not broken cards. And it's it's hard. It's, this is—it's really difficult work, and I'm thankful that we don't have to ban 
you know, three cards every time a new set comes out. Sure. Yeah. Uh, kind of related to the Planeswalker question, uh, someone in the audience has asked, uh, is, do you think that there's a reason why we haven't seen more Planeswalkers as Commander cards? Like, we just, we just received the two, the twins from Battle Bond, but we haven't really seen them as much since that initial offering. Is it just that it's difficult to get those into a different set, or are there other sort of restrictions? Well, you know, there's, there's a few things. One is, if you do something all the time, it stops being special. And if it's going to be this really cool thing, you can only pull out every now and then. You want to make sure that it is a cool thing, you only pull it out now and then. The second thing is, if you're making a standard legal set, and you start writing, this can be your commander on the cards, it can get a little confusing. For example, even with Will and Roe and Kenrith in Battle Bond, people would draft them in Limited, and then they'd start their game and put them off the side as their commanders, thinking <laughs> they could do that. And of course, you can't do that in a, you know, in a booster draft, but it says on the cards that it can be your commander. What's <laughs> up with this? So it does add extra confusion to the game there. But I'm sure we'll see Planeswalker Commanders again plenty more. There's lots of good space there. And as Sheldon alluded to, when we can design them with commander in mind, that really helps make sure that the designs are things we want to show up in commander. OK. Uh, this one is, I'm, I'm going to reword this one a little bit so that everybody can answer. The original question is, are there any plans to bring back underrepresented mechanics, things like Aura Swap or Transfigure? So let's just bring it out as, what underrepresented mechanic that you enjoy would you like to see brought out for things like a commander product? Benny? Um, as a longtime green mage, I would love for regeneration to come back. I love to regenerate my creatures from uh, stuff. And I know at one point they took away the Wrath of God and made another Wrath of God specifically so that uh, green creatures could regenerate from them, but then they took away regeneration. So I would. I would love for regeneration to come back. I understand it's not the best mechanic, but anyway, All that's right. my question. Banding. Banding, <laughs> baby. So one of the first decks, just straight up magic decks, I ever built and was very proud of, and I don't know why I was proud of this one, <laughs> was my very morph-heavy deck, which is like everything you put face down, you start flipping stuff up, no one knows what anything is. I would love to do a more focused commander deck someday. That'd be a lot of fun. That would be, be like, sweet. all right, this deck's got 40 morph creatures, Oh. Let's see if you can figure out what we, each one is, and maybe, I don't know, we'll Area. see. All will bender. Yeah. yeah. All will bender yeah. all the time. They're all will benders. I, I can print 18 more will benders than <laughs> a commander said. That's what those extra cards are for. I don't doubt you. Jeremy's will bender, and Gavin's will bender, and Sheldon's will bender, and Benny's will bender. I mean, there's, there's will benders for everybody. <laughs> all right. Um, so, specifically for uh, Sheldon, did you ever think when you were first helping to design the format, that it would become so popular to the point where it is today? It would be disingenuous for me to say yes. Right? I, I understood what we were trying to do from the beginning and, and knew that there would be a resonance. There, there were people who want beer and pretzels magic. And that's, that's really what we've held the line to with Commander. That's what we want it to be. We, we want it to continue to be a casual and social format. Not that we're... It's not that we're against if other people want to play competitive commander. More power to them. More. <laughs> Good for you, sir. Good for you. But, but we still want the format to stay true to itself. Uh, I knew that, as, well, as soon as, as, soon as the judges, um, and the judge community then was, I don't know, I think we had 2,000 or 2,500 worldwide judges. As soon as nearly all of the judges glommed onto it, I was like, oh, here we are. And um, yeah, so you know, not from the beginning. I wanted this to be our thing, and yeah. we were going we to keep it. But as soon as I saw that there were more, even more people with whom it resonated than I thought there would be, and of course, we unleashed the hounds of war. Oh, yeah. I definitely played one at my LGS at, in like 2007, yeah. after, after your article had come out. So. Uh, let's see. One of the other ones that I think a lot of people, along with Planeswalkers, have asked about on occasion, definitely, is do you, how do you feel about emblems and experience counters and other things that are permanent outside of the game and can't be interfered with? Should they be able to be interfered with? Like, should we be able to say, here's an emblem, I should be able to do something to it, destroy it, bounce it, something like that to affect it? Benny? Well, uh, 
I'm of two minds with that. I mean, that, I know that's not the best answer anyway, but like, I, I do feel like maybe there should be some way to interact with that. But then again, if you do that, it does take away its specialness, right? So like a, in, a, in a way that's sort of like you're in, it's like a quest item and you've gone, you've gone through all the different steps to get to that quest and you have, made, you have done it. So having the ability to take that away, I know um, is kind of a tricky thing, but there's also ones that are a little bit too powerful that it would be kind of nice um, maybe to give maybe to give a, a, a slice of the color pie that's a little underserved the ability to do that and just kind of keep it narrow might be cool I don't know so you mean red <laughs> yes maybe red red right red. Um, I think I think it would be a design and development nightmare to to really do it without breaking it um, sure but yeah, I mean, there's certainly games that I'm playing in, and I'm like, "Damn it, they got their Elspeth em emblem, and now what are we gonna do?" Uh, but hey, that's magic. Sometimes you, sometimes you get wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're all forgetting the best way to destroy an emblem is just kill the kill player, the player. Kill the right? Player. <laughs> that, that always works. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah it, you know, for us, what we've noticed is that uh, emblems that are very game warping are for especially for commander player things we don't want to do too much of and actually seeing the feedback from the rules committee and others on on emblems I mean that we're thinking about it a lot more when, when we're designing you know um, a lot of planeswalker emblems for standard are just meant to be big splashy things that will probably win you the game sometimes they can be emblems but sometimes they can also just be huge effects for example yeah. Jace the mind sculptor's ultimate it's not an emblem but it's still pretty good for beating somebody in standard you know <laughs> um, so there's a lot of knobs we can tweak there one thing I do like about emblems and commander that I do find fun when they're appropriately balanced is that it creates this kind of like arch enemy team up moment of okay Sheldon's got his Elspeth emblem off because let's be real Sheldon we all know you did and then we gotta how are we gonna take him down what, what are we doing about this and that creates this kind of fun moment of teaming up and unlikely alliances that I do enjoy okay so you kind of brought it up and I believe Sheldon brought it up in his last answer there how do you walk the line of commander being a fun slash casual format with also a, trying to appease your competitive desire to win. Gavin, would you like to answer that one first? You know, I, I think Magic, this is going to be a shocker, but wait for it. I think Magic is a pretty fun game. <laughs> and so when I'm playing a multiplayer game, I'm there to have fun. I'm there with my, with my friends, we're all looking around, we're having a great time chatting and playing a game of Magic. And yes, there's a winner at the end. And yes, when we're playtesting, knowing who wins and who loses and what cards are powerful, really important. But at the end of the day, when we're designing a commander set, the most important playtest question at the end of every playtest is, did you have fun? Because so it doesn't matter if you won, although sometimes it does correlate with fun. Um, it, what matters is that you had a good time getting there. And there's been lots of commander playtests where I have gotten demolished. And I've sat there and had a really enjoyable time doing it. And that's how you, we know that we've won with the commander set. And usually when it gets to the point of, like in Commander 2017, for example, there were a lot of games where you could just get your tribe together, put together your cool combo, a board sweeper comes out, you're done for, but you still did your awesome thing. You felt like you had a great time and you made an impact on the game. And that's what we're going for. It's like, did you have fun when you're playing? Build casually, play competitively. Mm. That's, that's really my mantra. If you build the Jason Alt uh, has the has a theory of the 75% solution of commander decks and you build you, you think about the best deck you could build build 75% of it and you can have a lot of fun with it it I mean if you really need to win every commander game that you play I, I think you're not maximizing your experience uh, I, I would certainly rather lose to something epic happening than just win uh, Oh, I got my winter orb and locked everybody down with Derevi. That's it's not fun. It's not fun to it's not fun to play it. And I have one or two decks that when I play them with my friends, I'm like, I don't want to play these with my friends anymore. <laughs> like, get out of here. And I'd rather yeah, I'd rather see the experiences happening. I'd rather uh, you know something crazy off of a um, parallel lives or something happen than just winning. And I think we have to define winning in more than just you're the person that won the game and, and enjoying yourself while you're doing it is, is really key, which is how we think about it, how the rules committee, which is more than just me, by the way, <laughs> right? Um, 
that's how we think about it and how we, we approach any decision we're going to make. Let's make sure we keep the game as fun as possible. Okay. Benny? So I, I've been playing multiplayer Magic since I started playing Magic, and one of the things that was really cool about reading some of Sheldon's early philosophy sort of uh, works on the, the format was that is maximizing the fun for everybody, right? So if you, if the only thing, if you sit with four people and the only way that they have fun is that they win, there's going to be three people who are losers, right? So what's the point of playing at that point, right? But if everybody has a chance to do something cool with their deck, then everybody wins, right? So Sheldon pretty much uh, talked about that from day one. It, I thought it was very appealing. It sort of transformed the way I looked at playing multiplayer magic. And uh, win or lose, I have fun. I'm, I'm over in the command zone, so feel free to come beat me, do some epic plays. Hopefully I can maybe do some epic plays too, and we can all have a good time. And, if, and uh, to, to go back to that, I get that that doesn't necessarily resonate with everybody. That, um, well, you know, you guys, you guys don't understand competitive magic. I'm willing to bet that there are not four people, Toby Elliott, Scott Larrabee, Gavin Duggan, and myself, there's not another group of four people that knows more about competitive magic than we do. We, we know competitive magic. We love competitive magic. We made our bones on competitive magic. This is not that. This is something different. It's intentionally something different. Okay. And we're not going to hate you if you play competitive anything. Crossing so, the streams is bad. <laughs> <laughs> we have a little under 10 minutes, so I want to ask some of the more uh, uh, unique questions. <laughs> some of the more fun questions here. Uh, one that we got that I think was really good. Uriah Oxford asks... You're going to lunch at a Dominaria's version of Buffalo Wild Wings and two pals, a planeswalker and a legendary creature, to feast on their signature meal, a non-legendary creature. Who are you going with and what are you going to eat? So you're going with a planeswalker and a legendary creature to eat a non-legendary creature. To eat a non-legendary creature? To eat a non-legendary creature. Uh, I've got an answer. Gavin's got an answer. Uh, oh, this is... I, I can see it in my head already. It's Prosh and Sarkin eating a kobold together. Like, <laughs> like, like he summons all these kobolds. Why do he bring some? He's not like... They're not like his buddies. They're just food, you know? It's like, oh, man, Sarkin's like, oh, this is delicious. Prosh is like, yeah, I come to this restaurant every couple of weeks. It's like great fine dining, you know? I'll come back here about uh, two more mana from now. And then they, uh, <laughs> they eat some kobolds, and it's wonderful. That's fantastic. Eating kobolds seems pretty good. Yeah, they're 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 not that tough. That's the thing I like right. about them. Right? So you, you bite into it, they're you, you know li just a little toughness. All right, I think that's good. Uh, <laughs> what is the best commander from Dominaria and why? Best commander from Dominaria. Moldratha the Grave Tide. He gets it. Moldratha the Grave Tide. <laughs> <laughs> I actually am a big fan of Joda uh, because it's another five color commander. And um, basically, if you can untap with Joda, like your wor the world is your oyster, right? It's just big, crazy, splashy spells. Hey, was, <laughs> was there any time in the design process that Moldratha had white in it instead of blue? Whew. Nope, it's always <laughs> been uh, those colors. Okay. We, we tweaked the numbers around a little bit, but it kind of always did what it does right now. All right. Uh, let's see. Are there any non-legendary creatures you wish were legendary? Benny? Oh, wow. Uh, non-legendary. Hmm. I'm drawing a blank. All Sorry. right, shall we? Move along. I, I think that any, any non-legendary creature that has a name should be legendary. If a thing has a name, has a distinct name, it should be legendary. But um, Uncle Istvan. <laughs> Uncle Istvan should be legendary. Uh... Solemn Simulacrum. Okay. Ooh. That's a powerful commander. Although I guess then you, you can't play many other colors. Right. <laughs> it's a little rough around the edges. Right. Search of those wastes. <laughs> For me, I think I would say, oh, it's, it's so, many, so many great choices. Coiling Oracle. Coiling Oracle is a nice one. Just turn two Coiling Oracle every single game. Turn two Coiling Oracle. I would just probably go with uh, Dark Confidant because Ooh. I would really like to build like a low curve black commander deck, put them out on turn two and just draw lots of cards yeah. over and over again. Get that great little thrill moment. And then you Maybe got spiky, but there then, you go. And then you would rename him to Robert Confident. Right, Robert. And Robert. It's, a, it's an invitational card, right? Exactly. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Bob Confident. 
Uh, are there any commanders? Uh, uh, other answer, by the way, uh, alternate answer is Rune Claw Bear, so you can build your all bear commander deck. Bears, bears, bears. And a lot of people will be down. happy with that. Yeah. Just make a legendary bear. Yeah. Someday, someday. Someday. Are there any commanders you play because of the flavor or the art and not the card itself? Flavor for sure. Okay. Um, what's that card? Admiral Beckett Brass. Okay. Um, I mean, the two decks, the first two decks I played this morning, the dinosaurs, yeah. the dinosaurs and the pirates, that's, that's, that's all flavor to me. A lot, a lot easier now that Ixalan has come out yeah. to, <laughs> to get the flavor out of that. Is there anything for you, Gavin? Rune Claw Bear. <laughs> <laughs> Benny, are there any that you play specifically because of the flavor? I, I like to play my Aurelia deck because I like to say Aurelia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's, That's silly, good. but That's good. anyway. <laughs> you can play the Azumi deck for the Oh Rats. Mm. Oh Rats. There you nice. go. Uh, let's see. The last one I've got on here is one from the audience, and it is more from for Gavin and Benny. But it's not commander related, but what is your favorite method of cooking? It's for Gavin and Benny, but not Sheldon. Sheldon yeah. cooks like crazy. I, I think they're just purposely daggering Sheldon. Oh, man. <laughs> it's good to have friends. Wow. I was taken aback by this. Well, so for me, I like really spicy food. So I really enjoy, you know, like a nice Thai curry or Indian curry, getting all the ingredients, making it from scratch, cutting up all the spices, and, and doing like a nice saute of, of everything. Uh, then you put your curry in. Mm, it's delicious. One of my favorite things to make. So that's that to Sheldon, actually. That's one. <laughs> just, just read what it is. Benny, do you have a preference? Um, I like one skillet dishes, usually egg-based. I love to throw in all kinds of vegetables and stir fry all that <laughs> stuff together. It's just, you know, that's kind of uh, that's kind of my go-to thing. <laughs> oh, I can't so, see that. Oh, okay. It's confidential. All, all right, right confidential. Sorry. All right, I think that about wraps it up. Uh, I want to I want to I, I say one thing before we sure thing. I was I, I thought there would be some chats about the commanders rules committee. Oh yeah, the I, I really meant it when I said that the rules committee is not just me. Um, and the rules committee has remained relatively static for a long time, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to. Uh, we're not. We are not opposed to the idea of expanding the Commander's Rules Committee, and if we did, the person would have to be committed to the format, would have to be um, committed to, to you know, magic, and share, to some extent, not 100%, share you know, the rest of the committee's um, vision for the format, and it would be also super helpful um, if maybe it was somebody that didn't look like the rest of us. <laughs> You know, it's the 21st century, and I, I wouldn't mind seeing not... I mean, Gavin is the youngest of us, and he's, like, 40. So, sure. um, no, the other guy, not Gavin. Gavin. Guy. Um, I, I, I think we have, to th we have to start thinking about, you know, I, the, fact that, the fact that I'm going to be 60 soon and have had a health scare, so we, gotta, we really have to start thinking about the future of the format. Um, so... We are definitely thinking about the future of the format. Awesome. Can I also say one thing, Jeremy? Sure thing. Very different from that thing. A, a question I get a lot at Wizards is, why, why do you do X uh, in Commander? And then, of course, I always say, well, actually, the Commander Rules Committee m makes, you know, makes all the decisions for the format. And then, of course, the questions start to become like, do you guys fight a lot? Like, like how, do, how do things work? Or are you like, you the mean mom, and he's like the grumpy dad? Like, how, how does this all work out? And what I'm really excited to say is we actually work really, really closely together on things. And um, in fact, for, this is something never told anyone yet, but you guys get to be the first to know, is uh, in for Commander 2018, we actually worked with the Rules Committee on designing some of the set. So a lot of things that you guys have been asking for, um, you know, filling holes in certain kinds of decks, things like that, Sheldon and his team had some really great ideas for this. So it really is a group effort, us working together on stuff. And I can't share that enough that even though the Rules Committee is all around the, the world and well, we're out in Renton, Washington, there's a lot of great chatter that happens between them. And I, I can't thank them enough for the hard work they've done in this format, making Commander what it is today. So thank you, Sheldon. 
Sheldon and the rest of the Rules Committee and to people like Benny who have written book, literal books about the topic because without people who are excited about the format, without people crafting the format, it would be nothing today. And right. thank you, all the players, yep. for playing Commander. It is awesome, and I can't wait to see for you to all see what we have in 2018. Oh, there's some good stuff. <laughs> awesome. All right, I think that about wraps it up for us today. So, uh, Benny, where can people find you online? Uh, I go by Blair Witch Green on Twitter. I also have a, a Benny Smith Writers page on Facebook, and of course, I write every week at StarCityGames.com. Sheldon, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Sheldon Menery uh, on Facebook by my name. Uh, you can find me weekly doing a Commander podcast called Elder Dragon Statesman with uh, Anthony Alonji, which is hosted on, by Legion Games. Uh, and of course, every Thursday, you can find me, man, I feel like I've said this once or twice. You can find me every Thursday writing about the best format in Magic right here on StarCityGames.com. <laughs> Kevin? And if you Google my name, you'll find everything there's to know about me. It's all on the internet. Uh, but, you know, Gavin Verhey on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, whatever new thing is that the kids are liking. I'm probably on that already. Instagram. Kids. So go ahead, add me. I'd be more than happy to chat with you about anything commander-related or otherwise. Well, thank you all so much for coming out today. And thank you all for coming out to the panel today. I hope you all had a wonderful time. And, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your SCG Con. Yeah.